cocktail party, right? And I'm sure that's your life. Yes, you're, you're my life. Yeah. Uh, and, and somebody comes up and says, oh, Marin Siddiqui, uh, how do you introduce yourself? Oh, gosh. Um, I work at Edinburgh University. That's how I introduce myself. Seriously. Okay. That's how I that, uh, okay. And, and so being a nice, polite person at a cocktail party, I say, really, what do you do at Edinburgh University? I teach religious studies. Because I don't say I teach Islamic studies, because as soon as I say that, people start asking, well, isn't it interesting what's going on inside the world at the moment? And I don't want to start that conversation at a cocktail party with ISIS. So I just say I teach religious studies. Well, isn't it interesting what's going on in the world at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise it was a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, listen, we'll, 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 we'll tackle global issues and you can give us all your answers later. But first of all, I want to talk about you. So, um, uh, and I want, this is a great book, My Way, A Muslim Woman's Journey. Um, tell us a little bit about why you uh, wrote this book, which is in a really very personal book, isn't it? It is, yeah. So, I.B. Torres had asked me several years back to do something on, something that was personal, something that was reflective, something that was theological, and a few years back I wasn't ready for it. Um, but then I thought, the questions I keep getting asked in public audiences like this, are the questions that I want to tackle in that kind of book. Mm. But make it personal so that I'm not saying one thing and living a different life and trying to bring the two together, but also something that would be comfortable in the hands of a student or a young scholar who's thinking about issues to do with humanity universally. So although it's written from a kind of Muslim woman, the title certainly wasn't my choice. Uh -huh. My choice, I have to say this, my choice was um, uh, between faith and freedom because I think a lot of people struggle, young people and people of my generation, uh, between what does faith mean in a life, in a society where you are free to choose. And that is a huge um, struggle for a lot of people, mm. the freedom to choose. So, but um, Ibi Torres said, no, we'll have my way. And I said, what is remotely Sinatra-esque about this book? <laughs> but they wanted it, so I couldn't. Perhaps the end is clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a break. Um, let's, let, let me just take that then for a minute, that faith, faith and freedom. Because um, these are universal issues, yeah. regardless of, of what faith that you come from. Uh, and, and I suppose my first instinct when I heard you use the phrase was that I thought you were going to talk about it being uh, uh, the, 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 the disparity or the, or the challenge that we all feel between the way that we want to react to our spirituality and our faith yeah. and what our religion asks of us and whether we should do what our religion tells yeah, us to yeah, do. Absolutely. Is that part of what you meant? It is, absolutely. Um, I suppose some of it is just provoked by young people asking the kind of questions that, you know, when I was younger, I wouldn't dream of asking my parents simply because you just did a lot of what you were told. Even though you grew up questioning things, there was a sense of there are certain things you do as part of being a person of faith. But now you can't do that with young people. Um, there's only so much you can say to them, do this. And you may not understand the sense of it now, but in a, in a few years' time you will. And it's good that they ask questions, but we don't have the answers to all the questions. So it's a matter of balancing how much can you actually allow them to ask and answer in a sensible way, and how much of it is it that they're going to find out for themselves. So, and yes, a lot of things you experience in life question and challenge your faith. So you start thinking, what is that noise? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I cannot just, <laughs> it's kind of distracting slightly. So. <laughs> so. What is it? Oh, okay. oh, it's the Tibetan monks. Oh, in which case, we can't take the mickey. We have to be deeply respectful. <laughs> Bless those monks. I love those monks. They're a set of cool dudes. So within a Muslim context, what are the questions that those young people are asking of their parents that you wouldn't have dreamed of asking in the past? Um, why do certain things? Why, do, why pray? Why perform certain rituals? Um, what does loyalty to faith mean vis-a-vis -vis loyalty to friends and states? You know, young, I think very much this is a culture of friendship, and young people are growing up close to their friends in a way that I never experienced. And it's not just because of Facebook, it's all kinds of things. Um, also, I suppose some of the questions are questions that m when my own boys were at school, um, they were asked, Look, why do you have a faith? All faith does is put obstacles in your way. So none of their friends had a practicing faith. Um, and they just saw faith as this huge obstacle that 
stopped you from doing the things you really wanted to do in life. And then they'd come home, and it wasn't like it was a con confrontation, but they would ask, this is what they're saying, and I say this to them. And a lot of the times it would be very open discussions, but even things to do with marriage, to do with what does cultural loyalty mean, what does, why do we observe dietary laws? You know, there are no rational answers to a lot of these things. Um, so it's very difficult, and they want rational answers, as if faith can be neatly packaged and presented to them in a rational way. So a lot of the book is reflecting on some of those issues, but then also issues that I myself have been thinking about a lot recently, about happiness, about suffering, about death. Um, so I've tried to make it more universal than just, you know, this is a Muslim perspective. Yes, and, and I want to talk a, a little bit later about how somebody in your position is dragged into the kind of spokesperson kind of mode, <coughs> right? We'll, we'll talk about that. But first of all, f for those who haven't read it, and, they, and I know that you're all going to, you make that <laughs> pledge, don't you? Yes? Yes, you all do. That's good. For those who haven't, um, tell us a little bit about your story and your background and how you came to be where you are. So I was born in Karachi, and I, my father migrated here in the late 60s, and we grew up in West Yorkshire. And... Um, I moved to Scotland when I got married and moved up. But when I got my job, my first job at Glasgow University, uh, someone said to me, um, I was interviewed by BBC Scotland straight away because this was a divinity school's first non-white, non-male, non-Christian appointment in 450 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, dragging Christianity into the 1930s. But to be honest, I think... <laughs> Um, I didn't think it was a news story, but it was a news story for BBC Scotland. And so they asked me to come and speak as to what the post entailed. And I just loved radio. I just thought, all you have to do is just go and speak. It's not like television where there's all this faffing around and you have to be there three hours before. Um, and then they asked me to do Thought for the Day and then Radio 4 heard about Thought for the Day and they said, we don't have a Muslim speaker. Would you like to do Thought for the Day? And of course I said yes. And I still remember my very first thought. I was in the little cubby hole in Glasgow, linked up to London, and uh, my knees was literally clicking against the desk, and I thought, they'll be able to pick this up at the other end. <laughs> but um, then I learned how to breathe and relax a little bit more. Um, so that side, uh, and then this, this, uh, this idea of being publicly engaged with faith, not just because of 9-11, I was doing it before that, was simply because I think, A, as academics, we have a duty to give s something back to the public, and also, I think there's a huge thirst out there for something that's above newspaper language, but not necessarily heavy theological volumes. And people are interested in the questions that we are asking. So I find all this very humbling, but I also find it very exciting because the questions you get asked challenge your own thinking about things. Let me, let me just take you back for a minute about growing up in, in uh -huh. Scotland. Uh, and, and growing up in West Yorkshire. Sorry, that's forgive fine. me, that's forgive fine. me, West Yorkshire. And then, uh, but then also growing up, um, well, just tell us about that first of all. What was that like to grow up in, in the community that you grew up in? It was, we, my family was originally from India and we migrated to Karachi. So we were quite cut off from the rest of the Muslim community. I think my mother was a bit of a snob really. She was, she was very much, we lived different lives. So we didn't know any better, so we led different lives. Um, my father was a doctor, so all his friends were doctors. <laughs> all their children grew up to be mainly doctors. Uh, I was heretic what went wrong, in that man, way eh? as well. I, no, absolutely, because when I said I want to do arts, s several people said to my mother, your daughter is going to be this liberal runaround and put her into medical school. I was crap at science. There was no way I was going <laughs> to do medicine. So, uh, but I knew I wanted to travel and I knew I wanted to do arts and humanities. And actually, at one point, my mum did say, she said, there's three, three sisters, and uh, she said, I want you to be an academic, I want you to be a doctor, and I want you to be a barrister. Yeah. I've looked at your personalities, and we did that. We honestly <laughs> did not know. We didn't know any Oh, better. respect to the mother. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yes. She did absolutely. her research first. She did her research. But she had no idea what that meant. She just, I think it was partly because she had been deprived of formal education herself. Yeah. So all her own aspirations were being lived through her children. That so often happens. Um, but no, I don't have any regret. I mean, I did want to be a journalist but that was condemned from the very beginning. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very to glad to hear it, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was like, you're not going to London, you're not going to be a journalist and meet all sorts of strange people. Whereas academia was always <laughs> safe. I know, I know. There's all sorts of strange people in Glasgow. <laughs> Doug Gay, for example, a mutual no, friend. Absolutely. I asked Doug Gay, what shall I ask Mona? And he said, ask her what she thinks of Doug Gay. <laughs> Do you want this public? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, fine, man. But, but um, yeah, so, so in terms of schooling, 
local comprehensive. We yeah. just went to school. All my friends were non-Muslims. I didn't have any Muslim friends right. until I went to university. Right. I never thought about it. In, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you didn't think about people's religious identity. And none of my friends were religious. Mm. I mean, even if they were, they never talked about religion. Mm. Um, but, but what about within the family? Well, I think it was more of a s subcontinent Islam right. than what you see today. So it was very much the food and the culture and the language. We were bilingual. We were brought up bilingual. Um, but very removed from the wider community. Right, because I'm, I'm getting... You're sort of suggesting that it was a more... I, I'm care careful how I use this word. Assimilated Islam. We were... We never had... I never had any problem thinking I was British and Muslim. Right. Because it was never raised. Right. And the way I was brought up, it wasn't an issue that you could be British and Muslim. Unless someone made it an issue for you. Right. But it was never an issue, either politically then, or even at home life. Yeah. Right. And you said yourself just now that that's, that's different to what you're seeing now. Well, everyone wants to know everybody's identity now, and as if everybody knows their identity. And I think that's quite tedious. <laughs> so, you know, it is, like, it is tedious. You know, we have so many different aspects to our lives. Yeah. Why, why sum it up in, oh, I'm a Muslim, therefore I have this identity? Yeah. Um, you know, I have far more in common with lots of people who are not Muslims and some things in common, but that's not an identity issue, that's just personality. No, sure. uh, in, a, in a while I want to, want to talk about wh where that leaves you with regards to personal, f personal sure. faith and spirituality. But, but uh, the question that does arise is those people who warned your mother that you were going to become a liberal runaround, yeah. you kind of have, right? In, in their <laughs> eyes. <laughs> not enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. Right, okay. I mean, I was the first young person at the time to go abroad to study. I studied Arabic and French. And, you know, that, concer that concerned a few people. And my mother was fine with it. She said, you know, she's studying and she needs to go. Um, but I think this idea of knowing that there is something bigger out there was within me from a much, from a very young age. So I, I didn't really think I was just going to go to university and then not travel and do other things. Right. So what was your intention in entering academia? Completely by mistake, really. Um, no, this is true. It's, it's quite strange, but when I applied for the Glasgow job, I heard afterwards that another colleague of mine who'd finished his PhD at the same time had also applied. But his name was very similar to another person's name, and they'd got the two names mixed up. Had he applied, I think he would have got the job. Uh. But I got the job, and when I went for the interview, um, I was expecting my first child then, and there were 11 guys from the Divinity School, all in their black gowns and their hats, um, because obviously there had been no female there, mm. and they asked all sorts of strange questions. And afterwards, um, one of them said, and I was still sitting there, I don't like any of them, but if you must have one of them back, take her. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that's how I ended up in academia. Yeah. <laughs> how was your working relationship with him after that? I was actually it? liked him a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did like him a lot. <laughs> good, good. Okay, so... so did you? When was the sen wh When was the start of a? Se uh, maybe you don't have this sense, but you seem from the outside to have the sense of, um, I'm not. You know, I, okay, I'm an academic. I'm doing the work, but I'm also looking outwards, making connections, doing the public work as well. When did that begin? I think right from the beginning, because I was very conscious that ethics for me was a big thing. So although I had trained specifically in reading and understanding classical law, so doing very minute, detailed studies. I knew outside what was happening was people needed to be engaged with some of the wider ethical questions. And so it was a personal interest of mine which grew simply because of what was happening and then what started happening post 9-11. And you know, a colleague of mine, who is still a good friend, said, oh, 9-11 has been good for your career. And I looked at him in shock, actually. I said, no, it hasn't been good for my career because the only thing people talk about is conflict and terror. And so nobody really understands anything else in Islamic thought other than, can you explain this and can you explain that? Um, but a, a friend of mine did say, he said, you know, you can't withdraw because you have a duty to, to the conversation that's happening there. And I, that, that resonated with me a little bit. Did you, so you felt like you had that duty? Yeah, I did, actually. I did. Was, that, uh, did, is, was that something that you sort of took to your friends and family, your partner, whoever, and, 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 and sort of felt supported and protected in, or did you just go out there alone? I just did it. Yeah. yeah. I thought you might. Who was I going to ask? Whose permission was I going to no, ask? No, I'm not talking about no, permission. You know I, mean? I don't mean permission no, at all. I mean, I mean, I mean um, did you have a sense yourself of going out on a limb? No, no. Okay. No. 
I mean, I think um, there were issues when I first came to Glasgow, and somebody said, uh, when I got the job at Glasgow, and uh, my husband, although he was raised in Karachi, he has his own accountancy practice in Glasgow. So he knows the community much better than I do. But when I got the job, somebody said to him, not knowing that I was his wife, um, do you know that woman who's got that job at Glasgow? She doesn't preach Islam at all. She teaches, she often wears trousers and skirts, she, her head's not covered. She never says, peace be upon him after the prophet's name. And he listened and he listened at the end. He said, yeah, that's my wife. <laughs> and, and they said, they said, absolutely. They were kind of shocked. Like, are you going to tell? He said, what do you want? I'm going to tell her anything. So it Good seemed luck. to me very on. <laughs> it seemed to me very early on that people had suspicions about what I was doing, yeah. but I knew that was. I think very early on, I knew that was irrelevant to my life. That what needed to be said and what needed to be done was important. So was your your view sort of uh, in regards to those people? I'm not. I'm not talking. You know, you're not my audience. I'm going over yeah. here. Yeah. Right, Absolutely. okay. So did that mean that you got... I'm not an apologist for Islam. And anyone right. who's read my work or <coughs> heard me knows that. Um, and I certainly don't think that by talking about certain things, constantly repeating things like Islamophobia, or you can't say this, or you can't say that, or our sentiments are hurt, you, th th there's any value to that. All you do is shut down conversations, and those conversations happen elsewhere. So I really f do feel very strongly that we live in a very open society, and for better or worse, there are things that need to be discussed, and we should feel free and confident enough to discuss them. Presumably that meant that throughout this period, as your star has risen, if you like, you've got grief and hostility from those other people, right? You must not have really, done. not really. Right, really? I mean, I think uh, there are people, I mean, uh, for example, when the Charlie Hebdo thing came out, there was a panel discussion uh, organized by the Herald newspaper, and I think they must have done it maliciously, actually. They got this strange person up, who I'm assuming is not in the audience, but he's a Muslim anyway, so he probably isn't in the audience. And um, he kept saying, oh, it's absolutely categorically stated in the Quran, there's no images of the Prophet. Now, of course it's not stated in the Quran, there's no images of the Prophet. But when I hear things like that, it just riles me because the audience out there doesn't know. They're going to take you at face value. And when you start making these sweeping claims about your faith and saying, oh, it's so neat and it's so black and white, you lose people and you confuse people as well. So for me, it didn't really matter what people thought of me. I just felt there has to be a balance between writing and thinking for an academic audience that has time to read your book and then translating that to the wider discussions that were happening around religion. Right. So, um, but I'm interested in the fact that there, there was not very much hostility then, almost like they gave you up. I think so. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think um, the fact that I'm female probably didn't help. Um, I don't trousers wear a turban. Well, yeah. I, trousers don't help. No, but these things are so trivial, but they matter to people. You know, what women wear matters to these people. What women, how women talk matters to these people. The fact that uh, you're not constantly saying we're being demonized, this matters to people. I'm thinking there's a huge audience out there that doesn't think like you. I think in the last seven or eight years, things have changed, though. The emails I get, the letters I get from people who are obviously Muslim by background and are far more appreciative because they know that we're losing a whole generation to one extreme or the other mm. because that generation isn't finding a middle voice. And it's worth pausing to think for a moment, isn't it, that all the things that you've discussed about attitude, behaviour, what women wear, how women are in public, th these, are, these have been universal issues around religions. These are not Islamic issues. These are. were issues for Christianity. They're issues in the American South. They're issues in parts of England, you know, for certain kinds of Christianity, for example. Absolutely. So, that, so there's that uh, faith and practice thing that we were talking about earlier, isn't it? That yeah, absolutely. That people ha somehow have to escape that in the yeah, people do, but I mean, you know, I don't know whether any one of you um, has seen the um, the website uh, Platitude of the Day. So, ah, uh, right. Tell <laughs> us all about it. Some of you might be writing for Platitude of the Day. I don't know, but it's a satirical website of thought for the day, and it is really, really funny. Um, and I sometimes, when I'm feeling brave, I look at they score you and and makes fun. They score but you, do they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, who's they who's going to that website <laughs> after? <laughs> <laughs> I've got one or two of your <laughs> colleagues who I'm going to score pretty low. Um, but, you know, some of the comments they make, yeah. even in that, you can tell if there's a difference between what a woman is saying and what a man is saying. Right. Right. So it doesn't, I think, I think women have to accept that what they say is going to... I mean, look at our party politics, what women say and how they dress and what they wear, and 
Liz Kendall and all the rest of it, Kezia Dugdale winning, there are comments made by them as women, even before people have heard their politics or their views. So, so, so for a woman entering the public space, as you were at the time that we're talking about, there is a certain, and, and particularly pecu for you because of the cultural background, but generally speaking anyway, there's a, cer there's a set of decisions that you've got to make about how am I looking, how am I going to sound, how am I going to present myself, right? Did you do that consciously? No, I mean, you, I think, I think it'd be disingenuous to say you don't think about how do I, what do I wear when I go to certain things, but not to the, f to the extent that it supersedes what you want to say. What you want to say has to come first. Um, if it doesn't, then you're, you're looking at it back to front. So, especially when you have an audience, especially when an audience is paid, you know, you have to give value for money. And I, and I think that's important. I mean, you, you should try and do that. So I don't want to go to places unprepared. I don't want to go to places and say, don't ask me a question on that. I don't want to go to places and say, I'd rather the audience didn't approach this area. Absolutely, it's a free, free society, free audience, they've paid, they should be allowed to ask and get the maximum that they can. So in this little p biography bit, what happens around 9-11 for you? Um, I, I mean, it sounds foolish now, but I hadn't realized at the time how big it would be in terms of global politics, global religious identity, then the war on terror. And it took a couple of years for me to realize that this wasn't going away. Um, but I think, uh, I suppose that in a way what it did was it put a lot of people on the defensive about religion, about Muslims, about Islam. Um, and it polarized the discussion really badly into, you know, because in a way 9-11 was everything that the West has struggled against. So it was uh, the capital of, um, the, I suppose in a global empire really, New York and jets, the kind of phenomenon of modern technology. And then you had these Muslims who were quoting verses from the Quran as they struck into the buildings. It was a, you know, I think uh, uh, th there was a conference I went to where they said that the images of the towers burning has been the most watched image ever. <laughs> and there's a reason for all that. It's not just because it is so dramatic. I think it's a combination of so many things that come to people's mind when they see the towers being hit. Um, and then the fallout from that. Um, so in a way, you're approaching it from all kinds of ways. Um, not just, this is America, and this is what these people did, and you know the whole Al-Qaeda thing. But actually, it's polarized the whole Islam-West discussion in a way that I think is really unhealthy. And, and for individuals, it, it polarized people's rece reception to them, didn't it? I, mm. I know a friend, <coughs> a friend of mine, uh, Salma Yacoub, who you, you must yeah. know, uh -huh. um, would, would talk about how she became politicized by the fact that people were spitting at her in the street the day after it happened. And, and did the most, I mean, the reason I got to know her is she did the most extraordinary anti-war speech I've ever heard in Trafalgar Square just before 2003. And now, of course, as you know, it's gone on to, to all sorts of other yes. kind of political manifestations. Absolutely. So those, those initial hostilities for people in some ways have, have led into a, a big engagement, haven't they? Yeah, but it's an engagement in... <coughs> I don't think it's a healthy engagement. Okay. Because I think it's an engagement in a very narrow sense, so we're only talking about militancy. We're, and, and I absolutely agree these are important issues, but we're almost coming to it back to front. So militancy and extremism in the thick end of the wedge. What we're now discovering through the prism of terror is there are a lot of things that were going on that society had turned a blind eye to, the Muslims themselves had turned a blind eye to 30 years ago, and now it's all coming to the fore. Yeah. But because you're looking at everything through the prism of terror, whether a woman is wearing a headscarf or whether she's, everything is seen through that prism. So you can't actually have a very informed discussion about a lot of things, because it's within the whole debate around terror. And of course, after Charlie Hebdo, it's again it's within the debate about freedom of speech. So let's step outside that debate for a minute okay. and think about Britishness and Englishness and cultural identity and all of that. Scottishness, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and think about the changes that have, have happened in the time, over the time since you, you became a, pu a public figure. A public intellectual. Oh, uh, I like that. I love that phrase. <laughs> how, how do you feel being a public no, intellectual? No, we don't, we don't use the phrase public intellectual here. It's, it's an American thing. It's on your biog. Yeah, but... 
bad at using it. Okay. <laughs> Anything can be on my bio. Yeah. <laughs> so you buy you don't agree with your bio and you don't agree with the book title. I think you need to you need to step up the plate a bit here, actually, Mona, to tell you the truth. Um, okay, but <laughs> but anyway, this this change, uh, which which I've written about and you've written about, mm -hmm. about the the change in our cultural identity over the last thirty or forty years. From my my take on it is that we we've ended five hundred years of imperial Christianity and now we're in a state of flux, reinventing ourselves mm -hmm. and becoming something else. And within that, um, all kinds of voices are competing: the extremists and and, sure. and we're looking for other voices. What changes have you seen since you began to move into that public sphere? Um, a narrowing of the Islamic discourse by Muslims themselves, and whether it's in reaction to what they're seeing outside, but it's become very much about, about identity in a really small way. Um, so when I, think, when I think back to even a couple of hundred years ago, when I think back to the richness of what was being discussed in the Islamic world compared to now, that's, I find that quite sad, really. And partly it's in reaction to what's happening on the global front. But also I think that um, we don't really do religion well in public life. So we have to have neat categories. We have to have simplistic binaries. Um, and I don't think that helps. And so one of the issues I've had with the BBC, and I've spoken to them so many times, that you, know, you need to have more nuanced debates about religion. So, <laughs> so it's not just that, you know, when every time we talk about Catholicism, it's about child sex abuse, and Islam, it's about terror, and Anglicanism, it's about women bishops yeah. or, you know, homosexual priests. But that's the way the media looks at it, and those are the stories that make the headlines. And I think for a lot of people, even if they're not affiliated or go or buy into structural forms of religion, I think what really gets me thinking is how people want to still hold on to faith even though they're not buying into the whole package. Yeah. And what does holding on to faith mean? Is it just having a belief in God? Or is it believing that there are some things that I think could be true, but other things are not for me now? And we just don't have those really sophisticated discussions in the Islamic world, not in the West. Mm. And we're finding, aren't we, in relation to broadcasters, in, in particular, I, I completely share your exasperation that you'll see, um, uh, particularly on a, on a BBC discussion, because actually the BBC is the only place where those discussions are taking yes, place. It ain't right. happening on ITV. Let's te let's tell the truth. Uh, you'll see, uh, you know, oh, oh yes, it's fine. We've got a bishop and we've got an imam and we've got an atheist. We're covered. That's fine. We're done. Yeah. And I always, and I do repeatedly say to them, look, okay, we know from from the from the surveys that even in the most conservative estimates, you've got something like 26 million people in Britain who say that they believe in God but don't yeah. belong to a church, temple, or mosque. Who's talking for those people? Yeah. Who's talking about that discussion? And I know that that's a, that's an area that you that you've explored, isn't it? That that yeah. that the intersection of of faith outside of of the institutions and outside of the the. the you know, the, the driving institutions? I think for a lot of people, the, the, the questions that they are struggling with um, are things to do with sexual identity, with marriage, with ritual, with conformity to certain laws. And although these might be quite universal, they're definitely true in, in the Islamic world. Um, and I, in the handful of discussions that I've been uh, invited to by Muslim organizations, um, I once spoke about the headscarf. And these, this woman came up, came up to me afterwards, and this was several years back. And she said, all you've done is confuse us. I'm not interested in the fact, just because you don't wear one, you're raising this whole issue. But the number of younger people who came up and said, we really need to be able to talk about sexuality and marriage and all this, you know, that resonated with them. Because where do they go? They can't go to the mosque for these discussions. They feel very reluctant to talk to their friends. Um, but they want to be able to talk. Right. So does that mean that people come to you personally Besiege They'll you write with to me. No, do, do they? No, no, nobody besieges oh, me. Oh, don't they? <laughs> They'll write to me. They might write to right. me. Yeah. Right, right. And, and people write and say, you know, I'm a Muslim woman, I want to marry outside the faith. What do you say to somebody like that? You know, at the end of the day. What do you say to somebody like that? <laughs> I'm asking you, what would you say? Um, no, I, I usually say, look, I think if you feel you can make a life with this person, absolutely. Happiness, I mean, happiness is important, and we t tend to underplay happiness. But be prepared for what your family and your friends and your neighbors are going to say. But I think if you are committed to this person, absolutely, because it's a very gray area in Islamic thoughts. The fact that people say, oh, no, you can't marry outside the faith, doesn't mean that's the only way to understand it. So I'm wondering, as I hear all this, where that leaves you in your own spiritual life. 
Now, maybe you're not comfortable talking about that. No, that's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Ask the question. <laughs> well, I'm asking you. I'm asking you what, in the end, you believe and what you do about it. I suppose. I, I question a lot what I really do believe. Actually, um, I know I believe in God, and I know there are certain aspects of my faith that are very dear to me, like prayer. Um, I observe dietary laws. I I don't drink, but you know, I'm not saying these are the most important things. Um, I guess I I'm asking you, Amanda, what are the life. what are the most important? I think I couldn't imagine my life without God's presence, and I think for me that is the strongest hold. Even if I strip faith of everything else, that's the one thing I want to hold on to. So, if, so if I was having this conversation with um, any one of the numerous uh, people who identify themselves as Christians on the platform out here, the next thing I would say was, okay, so what church do you go to? And that would be a very uncomfortable conversation sure. for some of them because they put they're out there in the public sphere and they and they and I'm including myself in this. So, where? Uh, but, but what's really interesting well, with any. Uh, public figure who is aligned with any kind of religion yeah. at all is that people want to know what your private practice is in relation to the things that you do. So mosque or, or, or um, the, well, the, the, mosque the practicalities. So the mosque is in the church for a start. So okay. there is no sense of, it's not, you're not defined by do you go to the mosque because right. you can pray at home. And we never did go to the mosque when we were growing up. Um, no, I, I mean, I do pray. And I, I mean, I think the the basic things I do, but if you s to ask me, well, what do you think of, you know, Shia Islam, or what do you think of non-Sunni, which is a major sex, and what do you think of intermarriage, or what do you think of people who do this, I don't have any definite answers to these things. You see and as I'm growing older, I have fewer and fewer definite, definitive answers to these things. See, that's that, that's that's where the, the the point of collision comes, isn't it? Because we, I, I can say, yeah, I, listen, I agree with you. I, I absolutely can't live without God in my life. I pray. I don't necessarily go to church to do it. Don't have to do that. That's fine. I adhere to certain cultural norms, and that's fine. That's part of my culture. Mm -hmm. But and that's fine. We're, everyone's happy, right? End of discussion. Fine. We do, we're all we're all living in a in a happy world. It's it's when um, it's when practice and and uh, religion in terms of the constriction of religion mm -hmm. comes into it that, that we, st we start to collide, isn't it? Well, it depends what you mean by constriction of religion. I mean... Um, you, I, I mean that you and I can agree happily, but uh, in, meanwhile, while we're agreeing happily, institutions that claim to represent us are clashing horribly in other okay, places. Okay, no, well, I mean, I think leadership is a really bad word. <laughs> Religious leadership is, has failed most religions really badly. Um, and I certainly don't think that Islamic leadership in the UK has done Islam any favors, to be honest. Um, most people were not trained to be leaders of any sort. They were just self-made people who became political activists and who happened to be Muslims. Um, and I think there's been a slight change in more and more people who are scholars of Islam in the West, so academically trained in the West, but who also have um, affinity to the wider public. They are now making headway with wider Muslim communities. So they've got the scholarship, but they've also got a public engagement. Um, but institutionally, I mean, for me, when I, when I was became interested in Christian Muslim stuff, just to go back to your question, mm. It wasn't so much, oh, I, I'm interested in this because I want um, everybody to be happy and understand each other better. It was a way of actually just thinking about my own faith. Mm. So when a Christian colleague or Christian friend asked me something, you know, what is love, God's love in Islam? I know that doesn't answer the questions of world peace, but in a way, there's only so much I can do in the remit that I have. Mm. So for me, if I understand God's love and God's mercy in one way and somebody else isn't seeing that in my religion, is there something that's, that's not being presented in my faith? Mm. And then I have to do something about that. Mm. I have to go back into and, and, and see what there is. Um, and I would ask the same questions of people of other faiths. But I'm not really interested in structural religious identities and what they're doing, because a lot of them are not doing much at all, to be honest. Mm. But uh, but as we were saying earlier, that is the problem of, of speaking out in public is that you get pushed into that position, isn't, isn't it? You some and and you know the, the the Muslim community. I presume the Muslim community does not exist any more than any other no, community absolutely. exists, no, right? Absolutely. But but somehow uh, somehow uh, w we in the media need spokespeople. So hey, yeah. you'll do. 
you when know. when um, the Arab Spring broke out, and that's not that long ago, um, Newsnight said, oh, could you come on and talk about Tunisia? I said, you do realize I know nothing about Tunisia other than it's got nice beaches. <laughs> and they said, and they said, oh, no, no, we need some. And then I said, no, you need somebody who's in geopolitics, who's in area studies, who knows. And then from then on, I actually did start seeing that they were making more of an effort. But I think the me media still do religion quite lazily. I mean, you wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't talk about the, the, BBC, the Today program's financial news with just anyone who happens to have a bank account. You, you know, you need people. But it's true, isn't it? And I think they, they, they don't... I'm not blaming them all the time, but I'm just saying that sometimes they're, so, they're struggling so much to get the, the voice that they'll just ask anyone. <coughs> but that's also about a desperation to get a voice other than the strident, isn't it? Because there are plenty of people who are, who are willing to step forward and say, hey, I'll be a spokesman for Islam, that's fine. Yeah, I know, but that's what we don't want. We don't want anybody to be a spokesman for Islam, Christianity, anyone. Yes, be a spokesman, say you're a Muslim or a Christian, and this is my view, but not I am, this is what Islam says, this is what Christianity says. That's the kind of thing that really riles me. And then going back to what you were saying earlier, you, you said as you were growing up, you were perfectly comfortable with the idea of being a British Muslim. I didn't think about it. Yeah. I didn't really think about it. So the, the, the fact that you said that suggests that you feel slightly uncomfortable about it now. No, it's because people keep asking me the question. <laughs> No, I mean, not you, but just generally. Yeah, but isn't, I mean, uh, uh, and, that, and that's no doubt true, but isn't that also partly because if we take this, uh, you know, we take this really as wide as it will go, it's because all the people who live in these British Isles are asking themselves what it means to live here now. No, I think, I think our, I think, to be honest, this has been a very generous place to grow up in in terms of giving you intellectual freedoms and social freedoms. And I think perhaps that's why when I was younger I didn't ask these questions because I felt I have the freedom to do and, and think. But the questions we're asking about identity now are really quite ugly and they're very narrow. And this is, this is not a resource issue. I'm not making a party political statement here. But actually to, to, to confine people into, into forcing them to think what are British values? What makes you who you are? What is your identity? I mean. It's all because of extremist violence. If we took all that away, we'd stop asking these questions. Because people don't think about these things. And you know, when we have questions like, do you buy into pluralism? Do you buy into gay rights? As if somehow if you say yes to all that, you're British, you can say yes to anything and not feel anything. So you have to feel that this is your home. You have to feel that you appreciate and that you're living in a, in a society which is blessed with that kind of freedom. Um, but forcing people into uh, ask answering questions in a certain way, and now with the whole migrant crisis, which I think is an awful phrase, um, you're we're again asking, well, what does it mean to be British? The British themselves, I mean, by which I mean the white Anglo-Saxon, know that there is no one British culture. There's lots of British cultures. White working class is not the same as the aristocracy, let's be honest. Oh, yeah, and too right. So <laughs> Um, but, I mean, even in that, and even if the larger population that comes to events like this and listens to Radio 4 comes from a certain background, even within that, there are huge varieties. Yeah. So when we start talking about we've lost something, what is it that we've lost? I mean, I'm, I'm asking this seriously, what is it that we've lost? And what is it that we're losing by, by what's happening now? I think we are big enough, we are generous enough, we are resourceful enough, and we are wealthy enough to think that a little bit of unsettling of what we once were is not going to harm us. I, I, yeah, I agree with that. I'm going to get to questions in just, in just a few minutes, so get them ready. But uh, it would be wrong of me not to mention this book, because it's also for sale. Yes. Um, and therefore important. <laughs> um, uh, here we go. This is your pitch. Pitch it to these people. Why should they read this book? <laughs> she's, she's <laughs> Yes, did it have a title that you liked? Uh, yes, this good. is fine. That's good. Because it's so simple that you, you'd have to read it to say what is it. I suppose um, it's because Jesus is used as the one person that Muslims and Christians either debate and agree on or disagree on. So I would say bridge or barrier. Uh, but also, I once remember asking a, a very prominent Christian ethicist, what is specifically Christian about Christian ethics? Um, and he couldn't answer it. And I wanted to know, it wasn't a challenging question, I just wanted to know. But I asked other people and they said, our ethics is Christ-centered. And for me, that was really quite 
inspiring Christ. So what does Christ-centered mean? So the book is really a theological history peppered with personal anecdotes about the history of post seventh century Christian and Muslims who may never have met each other, but who are writing about each other's faith to the present day. So both poetical, prose, philosophical. And then the last chapter is my personal, uh, this is a selling point. The last chapter is my personal reflection sitting in front of a cross in a church and thinking whether, what do I see? What do I feel when I see the cross? And I'd asked seven or eight of my colleagues what they thought when they saw the cross. And it's in the book, their answers verbatim. And some of them said, well, never think about it. And they're all Christian theologians, these guys. Um, one of them said, I have a wooden cross on my desk. I occasionally look at it. And it just speaks to me. Um, so I did that. And I was absolutely ready for whatever I was going to feel, think in front of this cross. And I asked, I asked quite a few people, which church should I go into for this? And um, Rowan Williams had said to me, you must go to the cathedral in Cologne. But I didn't have time to do that. <laughs> uh, so I just went to a local church in Glasgow. Um, <laughs> yes, it wasn't quite the cathedral in Cologne. <laughs> so, but, I, but I really enjoyed that bit. I really enjoyed writing that bit. Give us a taster of what you thought and felt. Um, I Read a bit I if you lines. want. Yeah. I am moved by the Christian theology of love, its radical implication of a God that dies so that man can live. But I'm not sure that I see the complexities of this theology as meaningful in my life. I don't understand the radical nature of this love, which makes God man and man God. If this is tied to the truth of the human condition, the brokenness of humanity, then I too see that human humankind is weak, vulnerable, and that sin and suffering are as much part of our earthly paradigm as love and hope. <laughs>